denim is in demand at Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston. Get cash on the spot for everything denim. Bring in your trendy and classic styles of gently used name brand denim. Get paid for your denim shorts, skirts, jackets, jeans, and more. We're looking for denim that is blue, black, or a bold color. And jeans and styles like mom jeans, bootcut, baggy, flared, and ripped. We want everything denim. Sell your denim for cash at Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Welcome into the Roaring Repeater podcast here live from Mountain West Media Days at the Circa Hotel and Resort in Las Vegas. Things are wrapping up here on a Thursday. Uh, spoke to Craig Bull today, players yesterday, Andrew Peasley, uh, the incumbent quarterback, of course, and the Preseason Defensive Player of the Year, Wyoming linebacker Easton Gibbs, joined today for the first time ever, Alex Taylor. Wyo Sports, is that what you guys are calling it? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) The Tribune Eagle, Laramie Boomerang. Also joined by fellow Wyoming beat writer, uh, Ryan Thorburn from the Casper Star Tribune, of course. Fellas, thanks for joining me. Good to be here, Cody. All right, good to be here. My uh, podcast debut. I'm ready to go. (laughs) Um, guys, I guess uh, we can start here. The Cowboys were picked to finish sixth. I think we all were stunned to see that when we walked in on uh, Wednesday morning here in Las Vegas. Um, Ryan, I know you, you selected them third. Alex, second. I selected them second. Um, I think we all know the reason, Ryan, why the conference media has the Cowboys <laughs> landing in sixth. Yeah, I thought fifth would be the floor, so I was a little surprised by sixth. Uh, When you look at it, it doesn't make sense logically because Wyoming has the most first-team All-Mountain West selections. As you mentioned, Easton Gibbs, to me, was a fairly obvious choice for Defensive Player of the Year because not only is he coming off a monster year at the position Wyoming has made famous recently, he has so many defensive linemen in front of him that are great players that he should have just a monster season. So... uh, The reason, as you alluded to, is the passing game. Uh, I don't think the media collectively or certainly Wyoming fans has any faith in that uh, until Andrew Peasley and these group of wide receivers, they have some new additions, some old hands combo there. That's going to be a good competition, I think. Until they they show up on a Saturday and, and let it fly, I think people are saying sixth place that to to them equals seven and six again and a a bowl game how about alex how about the teams that they picked ahead of the cowboys that's what was kind of shocking to me too i don't understand the love for san diego state at all i don't get it no i think i picked them six fifth or six but i was i was actually really surprised about san jose state being ahead of wyoming i mean obviously they had a quarterback coming back but i mean i i kind of like where wyoming landed though just i know craig bull alluded to it earlier but they like to kind of just hide in the weeds and uh preseason projections haven't really panned out for wyoming in uh, basketball and football the last couple of years so no. i kind of like them just kind of flying under the radar just going into the season this is your first media days, Alex, but uh, for Ryan and I, we've heard a lot of the same stuff we heard over the last two days, haven't we? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's talking season, and everyone, including New Mexico, I just talked to Danny Gonzalez. I mean, he is, I think, 3-20 and 20 in Mountain West games, and Rocky Long has... And two of those uh, wins are against Wyoming. By the way. <laughs> Rocky Long has abandoned ship even, so... Even New Mexico is like, oh, this is our best roster in years, and we're going to get some traction in non-conference, and we've played Wyoming close, and that's the opener. we got to just get the ball rolling. Everyone's optimistic. And, you know, Boise State, I think, is the clear favorite because of their quarterback, Green, who uh, Craig Bull said has, you know, some Josh Allen traits. doesn't mean he's Josh Allen, but, you know, we, we saw him in Laramie last year. He's legit talented, and then... You know, you're right. I think Fresno State, the reigning champion, loses so many big names. Uh, can Jeff Tedford just reload on the fly like that? I think the fact that they play in Laramie, I had them below Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming doesn't play San Diego State, but I would agree they're a little overrated and a little distracted with the Pac-12 noise. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, Bull did break out the lane in the weeds, quote again. Mm-hmm. Uh, that usually works well for Wyoming when the expectations are low. Kind of shows, too, fellas, that if you have a quarterback, you're going to finish near the top of this list. And 
Andrew Peasley, what I took away from my conversation with him, which we were all there for the conversation, of course, is that the knee brace is gone, the big bulky knee brace is gone. He was more injured last year than I think any of us knew. He had the concussion at CSU that really set him back. He said he wasn't prepared for Fresno State at all, which it showed. Um, he just he really was roughed up. We saw in Provo. He had a noticeable limp at BYU. Uh, he took he got hammered against San Jose State and had to come out for a play or two. A uh, tough kid, but not a very big kid. And now he said, "I want to rip it, and it's time to start ripping it." And it's his last chance. So, I. I, I think he said, you know, we we take it as coach speak, right? When when Craig Bowl says, "Oh, you know, the uh, pro style offense is really hard to learn," and you know, he, he he came in and didn't know anything. But actually, talking to Peasley about it, I believe it. He said, "I didn't know anything when I showed up in the spring." He never even took a snap under center. And then when I asked him about the two tight ends, Trayton Welch and John Michael Gillenborg, and how excited he is for them, he was like, hell, I never even had a tight end before I came to Wyoming. I mean, it was that much of a difference from Utah State. Do you feel confident in Andrew Peasley, Ryan, that he's going to take a step this year? I do. I mean, this is a, a guy from rural Oregon who's a ranch kid and who loves Laramie and, you know, the cowboy spirit and all that. He's the opposite of a BYU starting quarterback in terms of his background, but he reminds me of a BYU start, starting quarterback in the in the sense of his maturity level. Yeah, he is married now. He has just had a child. He's a, in his sixth year. There was no Mormon <laughs> mission, but he's in his sixth year, and he could get another one. So yeah. I, I just think physically, as you mentioned, he's in a great place, and I think emotionally, he's in a great place now. Some people might say, well, he has a newborn, he has a new wife. It's going to be how's he going to focus on football? I think. You know, he told me his, his wife, they have a great uh, tag team system right now where he's sleeping at night and getting his training in and helping out with the baby in the daytime. And, and let's face it, he's graduated probably with more than one degree. And he said he's basically, you know, taken a couple classes just to he's be a football eligible player. for football. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> his class load is pro-style offense 301. And I think last year he was at the 101 stage. And yep. Uh, it's a good way to put it. You know, it. he's uh, – it's make or break for Andrew Peasley, and, and I, I love his demeanor. Yeah. Speaking of his demeanor, Alex, he's just a cool customer, isn't he? Right. He just – you can tell how – he was able to step in and become a leader on this team immediately. It's just his the, his aura about him that he's not getting too high or too low. And like Ryan alluded to, you talked to him about having a child and a wife, and things are in perspective. He kind of smirks when you're like, do you feel the pressure? Because the fans are obviously all over you, and he's like, pressure? Like, dude, I got real pressure. But he still, you can tell he takes this very seriously. He That's what the biggest takeaway from this week for me. I mean, just you, when you're talking to him, you can say what you want about him. Uh, obviously, completed 52% of his passes last year, but he's he's confident. And I, I think you could tell that it was really disappointing for him to, to get knocked out of that Colorado State game last year and then obviously miss that Boise State game. He talked quite a bit about having to sit on the sidelines and, and watch, obviously, their, kind of their season or their Mountain West championship hopes kind of come to an end there. But I like, I like the way that he's kind of alluding to this season. Obviously, this is – his last season, his last go in Laramie. So the confidence is there. I mean, we'll see when, when Texas Tech's defense is uh, in Laramie in a couple weeks. But for right now, I think his, his mind is in the right spot for sure. Well, I think a big question mark too, fellas, that we just don't know is, and we asked him about it, and of course he's going to say it was great. Ayur Asante is coming in from Holy Cross. Uh, Devin Bodie Jr. is coming in, or Devin Bodie Jr., excuse me, coming in from Vanderbilt. He says they're great, they're really fast, they've been thrown together every Saturday. Uh, throwing together is not playing in a college football game together, and those two guys don't even know the offense. And we just talked about how hard it was for Andrew Peasley to learn the offense. Can these guys pick it up right away? Can Gunnar Gentry come back healthy? Um, two years in a row of devasta devastating knee injuries, I, and now you also got, what, three new starters on the offensive line for the most part? Two, three, some guys that have played, but you got a guy like Wes King who's stepping in and has never even played a snap. So... It's kind of hard, isn't it, Ryan, to put your finger on what this offense is going to look like? We know what it's going to look like. They're going to run the hell out of the football, but how is it going to look in the passing department? Right, and there wasn't a lot of news out of Wyoming uh, in Las Vegas, but Harrison Whaley is going to miss a couple weeks, Craig said, uh, after offseason knee surgery. And he's obviously the Northern Illinois running back transfer who they love and I, is still obviously going to have 
a huge role in Mountain West play. But so that first game is interesting. Uh, defensively, you're in good shape, but you're going against a, a tempo offense that can light it up if they're on point. Um, I think based on spring, I would count more at least early in the season on Wyatt Wheeland and Will Pellisier and Trayton Welch, uh, even John Michael Gillenborg to some degree, the guys that have already been on the same page with Peasley. Uh, you hope as the season goes on, I think Ayer Asante, given that it's his last season in college football yep. and he's been so productive, albeit at the FCS level, I think he's the guy that maybe can blow the top off the defense you know, as the season progresses. Yep. Uh, worried about the offensive line at all, Alex? We're, we're going to see some new names. Of course, Emmanuel Pregnon with his departure in uh, right after the spring game, conveniently. Um, you know, West King's getting thrown in the fire. Uh, that's all there is to it. And uh, Jack Walsh played a lot last year. But Frank Crum, of course, making the move over to left tackle. That's the bread and butter. The Cowboys' offensive line has to be great. Yeah, and I think, I mean, obviously with that run game, they're going to have to – there's going to be some new guys stepping up. But I think, obviously, like you said, Frank Crum getting that blind side and then – I think you said Jack Walsh is going to be right next to him. So I'm I'm pretty high on, on Jack Walsh. I know he started a couple games late in the year because um, of Watts injuries, but I think they're in a good spot. The one kind of red flag, and I know Craig Bull said today that that was his biggest worry is the depth. I mean, if one of those – one of those guys goes down, I mean, it's going to be somebody stepping in that's never played before. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where it's a position where you're kind of one injury away from catastrophic stuff. So, yeah. hopefully, obviously, you hope for the best. On the flip side, the depth on the defense is pretty much unbelievably good across the board. I mean, you, you see some new guys on the two deep, which the Cowboys did release a two deep, uh, which was nice to see. I saw, Ryan, you showed me New Mexico will not be releasing a two deep until they get killed by a and Do the they opener. have two deep? <laughs> yeah, do they even have two deep? Does Utah State have two deep? I don't think so. Um, the defense, though, they are in really good shape. You mentioned it, Ryan, that, um, yeah, Easton Gibbs is going to get a lot of – his stats are going to look unbelievable with that defensive front, but also – you're never the offenses are never going to get a break. I mean, Cole Goodbow and, and uh, Jordan Bernali are two of the best at getting to the quarterback at a, from the defensive tackle spots, which is a real rare, nice, nice problem to have. And then you get you know you'll have Devin Harris coming around, Devon Harris coming around the corner, but then when he takes a blow, here comes Braden Siders. Um, Tyce Westland also made the two deep. I know they like him a lot as well. Um, Sebastian Harsh, we don't even know. All we've heard about is how great he is, but obviously with his injury last year, we weren't able to see him. They're just going to keep coming in waves, aren't they, on that side of the ball? They are, and you know, as you mentioned, from all four positions, they can rush the passer and, and collapse that pocket. And it's not like the secondary is going to be, you know, untested unproven i mean they are to some degree but they love colby taylor we've talked love. to people in the program that think colby taylor is gonna have the type of attention emmanuel pregnant had this offseason i mean he's that good potentially yeah. if they have a shutdown corner like him you know with the hard-hitting rook brown at nickel you have you know rock solid wyatt eckler and isaac white in, in at the safety spots we saw tyrikas davis the junior college transfer cornerback uh, show Peasley that you shouldn't make uh, throws <laughs> across the field against him mm -hmm. with his speed and break on the ball. So really, I don't see a weakness on this defense other than last year they missed a lot of tackles that they were in position to make. They say they've shored that up. If they make the tackles that they're in position to make, this is uh, the best defense in the Mountain West. Well, with New Mexico, with their gamesmanship of not putting out a two deep, I think Wyoming's got a little gamesmanship on their side, too. Uh, I, I don't know about you. I was a little stunned to see Ja'Cory Hawkins and Dur Duran Harrell being the starting corners yeah. for this team. I don't think it's going to be that way. And we talked to Craig Bull about, our, can you win or lose a job in the fall? Right. He mentioned the corners. Those guys can lose a job. Those guys can get a job. And I know all we saw was sp the spring game and heard what they said during the spring, but right. sounds to me like Ty Tyreekus Davis and Colby Taylor are probably going to be those guys, along with Ja'Cory Hawkins coming in and out. I, I'm here, we were hearing you know, in some of our talks that Deron Harrell's not even healthy. So I think that's a little gamesmanship. Yeah, I'm thinking, obviously, Colby Taylor's name has came up a ton. Constantly. I'd be shocked if he wasn't cornerback number one and I think an interesting point with him that 
we had talked about earlier, but I, I think with them having that lockdown corner going back to Rook Brown, it kind of opens him up to, to go in at the quarterback, get him on some blitzes with that, that secondary. So it should be interesting. I mean, I'm not – the defense is, is the least of my concerns with this team. And I'd, unlike last year, the secondary is looking a lot better than it was at this time last year. Well, that could be a message like, okay, we, we talked to you new guys up all spring, but you got to <laughs> get it. through three weeks of fall camp and prove yourselves all over again. It starts over. And, you know, it could also be a technicality. I mean, against Texas Tech, you might have to start, you know, three of those guys yep. so uh, you know if they spread you out with four wide receivers or whatever so uh you know it's a good problem to have i think they have three rock solid cornerbacks right now and in years past they've had one and a half maybe maybe yeah the one thing i see for c happening fellas is and easton gibbs talked to me about it i don't know if you guys were there but he had 121 tackles last year he forced two turnovers now I think they're going to have so much depth and they're going to come at you and wave so much that the turnovers are going to come. I mean, they're faster, they're stronger. And think about it, guys. A lot of people forget about this as they're bitching about the Cowboys only going to the Arizona Bowl and only winning seven games. It's the third youngest roster in the country. A lot of those cats never even had played football before. And now they're household names. And they didn't have a guy like Sebastian Harsh who, from all accounts, is so dynamic that he's going to, he's going to knock the ball out of some quarterback's hands, you would think. They've all talked about it. I think turnovers are, I believe they only had 11 last yeah, year. Yep. That, I believe, is going to vault up maybe double. Yeah, well, how many times have we talked about this a ton last year, but how many interceptions could they have had? I mean, I think in that Hawaii game alone, there was three or four that – Pick six called back. Right through the hands. And I know, I obviously, it's kind of a – some luck is involved, and obviously there's some weather, but uh, I, I would be shocked if that number isn't – near double this year, especially with the way that these guys are talking about the secondary. It reminds me, and Craig talked about it, the 2017 team with Carl Granderson and those guys, they had so much depth and so much speed on that side. I want to say they finished the year with 37 turnovers to lead the country. And I think eight of those came in the bowl game against Central Michigan, but that's just what they're capable of. And we're talking about this defense could be better than that one. And if you're getting those turnovers, there's not – the type of pressure and Andrew Peasley had him had on him last year, when you know when you have the ball and, and your defense turns it over and you have to go 30 yards instead of 75 yards, I mean the analytics would say it's I mean it's night and day. So uh, I think that'll be a huge boost to the offense with if the defense is taking advantage of all this talent. No doubt. I love too speaking of turnovers. I love. Um, how the Boise State, Devon Harris's uh, fumble recovery came up a couple times this week. And mm. obviously some time has gone by, but uh, that, that one still hurts. And I, I loved hearing Craig kind of joke, like, obviously the Boise, the Boise State coaching staff was already on their way down from the press box when he gets that fumble. And then obviously it didn't go their way. But I would be just speaking on the defensive line. I mean, I, even Devon Harris, like individually, I would – they're going to get some fumbles for sure. Is there anything better than seeing Craig Ball's impression of Devon Harris and talking about <laughs> what a weird character he is? No, I'm not going to do the impression <laughs> because I want to save my like voice. That. But that's the thing that I think is interesting about this team. I mean, you mentioned Pregnon. Obviously, uh, they lose Pregnon to USC. He was obviously projects as a great player. I think he was still a work in progress and was probably – you know, a season away from the NFL at least. But beyond Pregnon, the portal did not impact Wyoming in a negative way, in my opinion. No. Uh, and, and the cool thing about it is just the vibe and the chemistry and the loyalty of the people we talked to. Easton Gibbs' phone was ringing from Power 5, got, you know, people. Uh, he ignored that. Uh, Frank Crum, same thing. Uh, the guy, Cole Goodboat, could be, you know, he, he could try to turn pro anyway, or he could have went to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep. Um, but these guys want to to leave a legacy, I guess. They want to be able to come back to Wyoming in 25 years, and and people will know who they are and not, you know, just grab a, a short-term uh, little bag of cash or whatever. In fact, Gibbs is funny because I'm like, are you doing any NIL, which – you would think would be there for him, especially with Wyoming starting collective. He'd have to be at the top of the list. He basically said, 
I don't give a crap about that stuff. And uh, well, that's a Wyoming linebacker right there. Yeah, yeah. Easily the same way, even though he could use you know a deal with some diaper company. So, uh, I think when you have a team this galvanized and and loyal, I think that's why Craig Bull in year ten is so fired up. Craig Craig Bull said today he alluded to the the mass exodus of players in 2021, and it was interesting going off that he just said. The guys that did stay got together, and they said the guys that that stayed are going to win a championship. So yeah. I think that's what we're kind of seeing in uh, that locker room right now. I don't think we give enough credit to Craig Bull. Ryan, you and I saw after 2021, those players who left off the record all said, I had zero relationship with that guy. And we know Craig was a nightmare during COVID because he loves to control things, and he had zero control. Andrew Peasley said it perfect this week. He called Craig Bold the CEO of our football program, and that's what he is. However, now he's not the CEO who sits up in his office. He's the CEO who comes out and says, how's your mom doing? Um, Jackson Marcotte would tell me that Craig would always talk about the best spaghetti and meatballs he ever had in his life was on my recruiting visit, which was, what, six, seven years ago. Um, so now he really, you wondered if you could teach this old dog new tricks, and it's happened. And it's such a refreshing thing to see. Craig's funny as hell. <laughs> he was funny as hell today. He's so quick and he's such a, you know, just a, a good dude. He really yeah. is. And it, that's what always bothered me about why he was being an asshole to guys before. Now he's got it figured out and it seems like it's working. I understand the fans' frustration with the passing game. I totally get that. Since Josh Allen went to the NFL, it's been really, really bad. And they have not found that next guy and we don't know for sure if Peasley is going to have a good year or not Uh, they have some guys behind him that I think they're pretty pumped up about for 24 but you're right I mean you know he said it today we had the kind of the same uh, wavelength on our early questioning like you're going to turn 65 this year it's year 10 your contract ends after 24 you know what's going on there and my takeaway was you know even though he said I'm old school he's willing to adapt and change and I think he's going to be around beyond 2024 if things work out the way he thinks they are this year I think you know Gloria Navarez the Mount West Commissioner I was talking to her yesterday and I said you know what's your relationship like with Craig Bull and she said I basically pick his brain more than anyone because you know he's the president of the coaches association he's been around forever she had him uh, get involved in a coming up with a strategic plan for the Mountain West for the next five years. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he, you know, tries to see that plan out for Wyoming and the Mountain West. And yeah. and with the playoff coming, I think that's a carrot he's interested in taking a bite of before he retires. I mean, he's already a legend at Nebraska and North Dakota State and with his longevity at Wyoming. But if you win a Mountain West championship or – by some miracle get into the playoff one of these years, I mean, you're a Wyoming Hall of Famer as well. Uh, you know, so you know what I kind of like this year? So this will be the first year the Mountain West goes away from the division format, the two-division format. And I I kind of like what that does for Wyoming. I mean, just they're not, they're not on the same side as Boise State. I think I, Craig Bull had talked about it earlier today, but it, it ensures – that the two best teams are meeting for that Mountain West championship game. So, And he loves having that championship game, too, because if you're going to make this, this college football playoff, you, you need to go through the gauntlet yeah. and prove yeah. it. So I really like that answer, too. Uh, fellas, Ryan, I, I really like this team. This is not a sixth-place <laughs> team. There's not a shot in hell unless something really bad goes off the rails. I don't see it going off the rails because something – you and I have followed this team our entire lives. They – rarely have depth and I think that's going to play a big part most Wyoming fans would be pessimistic and go Texas Tech and Texas Mm -hmm. those are body bag games those are when guys get hurt I don't see that I see these as an opportunity I'm not saying they're going to win them both but I'm saying I see this as an opportunity to do you think they're going to be intimidated to go into Boise Idaho after going in front of 110,000 people in Austin Texas or playing Texas Tech they're I think that these are set, setting them up to be prepared to play and to kick ass in Mountain West play. Right. I mean, I think in 21 they had names that, you know, big names, and they thought they had some depth. 
and they obviously started 4-0 and against a really poor non-conference schedule. And that wasn't impressive either. <laughs> but those guys, once they lost the opener to Air Force, and once they had the friction at quarterback with Sean Chambers going in the tank, Levi Williams, you know, a game too late, in my opinion, becoming the starter, and then obviously the portal opening up for the first time. Uh, this has a different feel, like everything we've touched on. I mean, these guys want to be here, and, and there is quality depth behind these starters. Um, you know, like Alex said, offensive line, maybe the depth is the one area that could bite you. But, yeah, and it, the only thing I could see is, you know, if Texas Tech is as good at advertise and thumps you and then, you know, you get thumped at Texas and have some injuries, you know, maybe that could be an issue. It's a very difficult non-conference. I think the key game is App State after Texas. you got to find a way to beat them and be at least 2-2. Two 2-2, and two. Two and two, yeah. yeah. But – I think this team thinks they're going to beat Texas Tech. Yeah, you know, and I don't think anybody else in the world does. So <laughs> I can't wait for that game. I mentioned to Jay Savell that it has Missouri written all over it. He disagreed, but he disagreed <laughs> because of the style of right. which Texas Tech Texas wins. Texas Tech is probably better than Missouri. But this has that feeling to me that a sold-out crowd, perfect weather, amped, ready to roll. Texas Tech maybe looking past to Oregon. They they want this game too. Yeah. That's the thing. Like Easton Gibbs and, and Andrew Peasley, t- this whole week where they want to play Texas Tech. And I, I, the thing that I loved um, about Peasley during his meeting was just they have to come to Laramie. Yeah. They, like that. Like and like you said, they're kind of over. Might be overlooking. The Cowboys their fans over. certainly are right now. And there's, I mean, the elevation got brought up, but, I mean, it it could be, it has the recipe to be interesting. I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to yeah. make a prediction or anything, but yeah. I, it could be interesting. I agree. <laughs> so the uh, preseason rankings here, guys, Boise State, number one, overwhelmingly 28 first place votes for the Broncos. Not shocked there. I believe you guys voted for Boise first. I did as well. Air Force 2, a lot of people love the Falcons. Mm, they got two first-place votes. They are replacing a three-year starter at quarterback and replacing the nation's leading rusher in Brad Roberts. I know they're a machine that just churns, but, I mean, that's damn good production that you have to replace, even if you are Air Force. Uh, Fresno State at 3, like you alluded to, Ryan, they're just – they lost too many dogs, man. They, they had some great players on that championship team. You saw the way they looked without Hainer last year when he was hurt. They were hideous bad. They lost to UConn. I mean, really bad. San Diego State, I don't understand what, what the draw and appeal is to them at all. They even got a first-place vote. Uh, number five, San Jose State. Chavin Cordero has been in this league for 100 years. Um, he has some really good outside weapons. They also lost a ton, too, especially on defense. Cowboys coming in at sixth, uh, seventh, Colorado State. That's probably about where I picked CSU. I think they're going to be improved, maybe yeah. battling for a bowl spot this year. Yeah. Still young, super young, and that offensive line was hot garbage last year. So <laughs> so young they couldn't bring any of their star players to uh, yeah. Circa. They have to be 21. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Utah State, Cooper Lagos, once again, their quarterback, uh, finishing eighth. I, I think, honestly, guys, the bottom half of this conference is kind of interchangeable. Right. Number nine, UNLV, uh, also bringing in a first-place vote, which we heard that guy will lose his <laughs> voting privileges and never be allowed to vote again. He's also from the state of Nevada. I wish we knew his name so we could call him out for the moron he is, but we won't be dealing with that anymore. Number 10, Hawaii, yeah, uh, 11, Nevada, 12, New Mexico. You're working on a story about New Mexico right now, Ryan, but I, I think New Mexico, it's hard not to improve from what it's been, and they're going to switch their they're going to switch their offensive scheme. And you know Rocky Long, of course. I'm not saying New Mexico is going to do much this year, but I, I think you said they have a real favorable schedule and non-conference anyway, aside from Texas A&M and uh, a pissed-off Jimbo Fisher and a pissed-off fan base that's ready to beat the hell out of everybody in its, in its play. But... I think Nevada – I picked Nevada dead last. I think New Mexico is going to be a little better. And we. I think personally we kind of hope so because Danny Gonzalez is an alum and he's such a good guy. Yeah, he is. I, I had Hawaii last, actually. I think New Mexico, Hawaii, Nevada are all going to be awful. Yeah. I think, like we talked about, there's optimism there because the coaches are fairly new. Timmy Chang, uh, Wilson in Nevada. Barry Odom at UNLV. Yeah, Barry Odom. You know, I asked Barry, what do you remember about your Missouri team coming to Laramie? He's like, that's why I'm here. 
<laughs> That's a fact. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, the bottom is very bad, and what's uh, encouraging for Wyoming, uh, you know, obviously the, the non-con is tough, as we mentioned. Uh, you know, you're at Air Force Boise. I think you need to split those road trips and stay in the mix. But they end with the border war at home, uh, and then they uh, – UNLV, UNLV. On a they have yeah. UNLV on a Friday night and then at Nevada. So you're ending with some of the worst teams in the league. So if you can survive early, uh, unlike last year where you end with uh, Boise State and Fresno State, the two teams that made the championship game, and you're out of gas and out of bodies, I think uh, Wyoming could have a November to remember. They just need to stay afloat until then. No doubt. I'm high, I, I'm high on Air Force. I think I picked Air Force third. So I picked Wyoming second, Air Force third, and I did – my thought process was it's just it's going to come down to that head-to-head tiebreaker who wins that game, and we saw what happened last year. But who knows with Air Force? And like Wyoming's said. defense is going to be even better than right. what you would think Air Force's offense is going to be. Plus, essentially, you haven't been down there yet, Alex, but it's essentially a home game. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, the Cowboys almost have eight home games. I d- I've never looked at Falcon Stadium as being some scary place. I've looked at it as a place that has ten thousand Wyoming fans in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, I picked Air Force second because of four words, Mr. Howdy F and Duty. Troy Calhoun is a great football coach. Yes, I know is. Wyoming fans, he gets under their skin, and I, I get why. Uh, you know, I, we, we watched the highlights of last year's Air Force game, and I was noticing on that when Wyoming's kneeling down, the best play in football, that they're still diving at the offensive line's <laughs> knees on yeah. those plays. So uh, I just think he's... He's a coaching savant. and yeah. uh, But the good news for Wyoming is it, it seems to me that Jordan Bertinoli and Cole Goodbow have solved Air Force. It's yeah. a matter of Peasley uh, you know, continuing those 13 play drives and finish it with touchdowns instead of field goals, and I think they'll be in good shape. Today. That was huge last year. And Easton Gibbs talked about it. I mean, fans remember Easton was sicker than a dog the night before. He spoke about that a little more this week. And he was sick, like triple-digit fever, throwing up all night. I mean, it was rough. And he said he couldn't even walk like two hours before game time. Um, he was that out of it. So he said about a half hour later, he said, man, maybe I can walk. Maybe I can go play a Division One football team against a team that's going to run the ball 80 times today. <laughs> And he came out and had a six-tackle game. But what he said was so huge is he expected to miss at least half the game. But Wyoming held the ball for almost the entire first quarter, so he was able to come in on the Cowboys' first defensive possession of that game. What's remarkable to me about Gibbs, beyond you know the 121 tackles in the Air Force, you know Michael Jordan fever game <laughs> yeah. feel to it, he had a torn labrum in his shoulder virtually all season. Yeah. Yeah. I know he's not a quarterback, but... That sounds painful for a Shea Sui and Noah had one, too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so these guys are, you know, they sat out spring to recover. I think they're, the key to those guys and just the team in particular is uh, to have that juice at the end of the year. They were out of gas, as I mentioned. Yep. Remember, they beat Colorado State. They're 7-3, and three, and then just the wheels came off. Yeah. Um, Alex, sitting out, that's a great point, sitting out the spring – for these guys was not necessarily a bad thing. No, I, there was a long way. There was more guys that didn't play that did. I, I loved it. Like, hey, yeah, and it was, I mean, get the good, get the younger guys in there, get them reps. And obviously, Easton Gibbs doesn't need to be practicing in spring anyways. Yep. But there's, I don't know, like you said, I mean, I feel like coming to Vegas, being around spring practice, there's, um, there's a different vibe to this team. And like you said, kind of going back to Craig Bull's thing, I mean, I feel like he's really got this locker room together, and I think mm-hmm. that's that's going to be the biggest thing for, for finishing a street season strong. And speaking of him adapting, he told us, like, for fall camp, he basically said, does Cole Goodbow need to go through a 50-play scrimmage? No. <laughs> would we Craig, already know what he can do. Would Craig Bull have said that three, four right. years ago? Now he's, you know, he's thinking about finishing the season, and they don't need to see, beat up Cole Goodbow in fall camp or Easton Gibbs or mm-hmm. – you know, Any a lot of, of these guys. Yeah. So uh, they can develop even more depth if these freshmen, I mean, he loves this recruiting class and the walk-ons. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to be the ones banging heads with uh, backups to see, you know, who's on the second and third teams. Guys, I don't feel like we're falling for talking season. 
You know what I mean? Like, everybody can be in here and be optimistic, including the beat writers of all these teams, because <laughs> yeah. it's all happy, happy, happy. I don't feel that at all. I feel like... I feel like Craig's like even calm. Like it's yeah. they're it's, all they're it's all time. business this week. And yeah, I, I like that. I do too. I like where their everybody's head seems to be at going into the season. And it's a quiet confidence. It's not the stuff he was saying a couple years ago about we're going to kick the door down. He that he was like never again. And we are kicking the door down. And he and we thought he had uh, the guys to do it that year. But this year, I know the big question marks around Peasley, but. I feel really good about him. I think he's going to be fine. Evan Svoboda is the backup. He said today this too deep uh, for the most part is kind of set in stone. And um, I think Andrew talked about it yesterday. He said, I'm not a big guy. That's why I didn't run the ball a lot. Plus, the Cowboys had no idea what was behind him as far as a quarterback goes. But now they know what they got in Evan, and I think they're going to let it rip. And I think – we were we praised Peasley last year for all of his throwaways, um, you know, instead of forcing things. I think now the ball goes under his shoulder and he goes forward. Yeah, yeah I hope so because you remember the San Jose State run yeah. where it was like, you know, 70 yards or whatever. Yeah. He had a bad wheel on that run. Yeah. He was not healthy on that run, and he was out running some really good defensive players on that. So. We saw it a little bit in the Illinois game. You know, he yep. kept them in that with the bootleg. Yep. You want to see as much as, of that as possible. Let your inner Josh Allen loose. <laughs> I know he even said, I'm not Josh Allen, but uh, I'm crafty. and I'm faster than Josh Allen. I can do different things and, yep. make, and make my own mark. Gibbs and, and Craig Bull bowling at him, but Andrew Peasley is one of the fastest players on the team, and I believe him. So that San Jose State run was incredible on a bad wheel. I believe his hip was hurt right. in that one. Yep. Um, and not to mention a big bulky brace on his right knee. Um, on the injury front, I guess um, Gunnar Gentry is making his way back. I know we're even kind of holding our breath on that because he it's just been a rough go for him. Um, however, DQ James, uh, some good news on his front. He tore his ACL against CSU last year. Um, he didn't participate in the spring, of course, but... Um, even without Harrison Whaley, I don't think you're really worried about that unit at all against Texas Tech or against Portland State. Um, DeWine McNeely, I think if he had two hands last year, um, we could have really saw some – we saw some special bursts from that guy anyway. Is he – so do we think McNeely is a thousand-yard rusher or do we think – how do, how do you think the time gets split when, when Whaley comes back? That's the thing. I don't even know if you want a 1,000-yard rusher. Maybe you want three seven 800-yard rushers, and that's what they could potentially do. I mean, yeah. DQ James, 40 attempts, 8.6 yards per carry. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they have crazy talent back there. We, I wish we would have saw LJ Richardson in the Arizona Bowl. He obviously had a snafu at the airport, wasn't able to make it to practice. He didn't practice. He didn't play. Uh, they moved Sam Scott back there. They tell me, we heard Craig Bowl say, Sam Scott's probably the most athletic guy on this team, and he's a linebacker convert over right. to the running back spot. So I think they're going to be loaded. Plus, they got the kid coming in, that Keani Parks kid from Wisconsin who was Mr. Everything. I saw on social media every day he was winning a gold medal at something in track about every day. So I don't think any of us are worried about that position. No, it, was, <laughs> it was funny, too, uh, Craig said, today somebody had asked him about the running backs, and he, he actually went back and he said, he almost felt like he relied on Titus Swen too much last yeah. year. They, obviously, they had a ton of injuries at the end of the season at, at the running back. But I like going back to what you said. I mean, it should be a fairly balanced attack between those top three guys. Yeah, I think two hands. Dwayne McNeely probably gets a hell of a lot more carries <laughs> last year. Good player. Um, Easton Gibbs did tell us this is it for him. He, uh, you know, barring anything crazy injury wise, he is, uh, this will be his last year as a Wyoming Cowboy. At first, I didn't even think he knew that he had an extra year of eligibility. <laughs> COVID's even screwing them up. Um, Andrew Peasley even said he could have an extra year if he wanted to, possibly getting a medical red shirt, but uh, he's done as well. So. It's kind of now or never, isn't it? And, and, and I think the Cowboys are also set up for future success, but I think it's now or never for a lot of these uh, elder statesmen, if you will, who've been through, think about all the crap these guys have been through since they got to Laramie. I mean, they've seen it all. Frank Crum's one of those guys. I mean, there's a list of guys that are quote-unquote super seniors. Uh, this is their last ride, and you know that's why I think there's the optimism, because they have the leadership, and then they have – you know, talents like Gillenborg emerging and, and Buck Coors and these fill in guys but that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, you know what you know what I like too about both of the guys that were here. So obviously from from 
reporters that don't cover Wyoming, they were asking them questions, their NFL counterparts. So I've seen Gibbs got a lot of uh, Logan Wilson and Chad Muma mm -hmm. questions, and I, I really liked Peasley had a really nice quote about him. Just he's he's not Logan and he's not Chad to me. He's just Easton, and, and I think it just kind of both of those guys. They just kind of want to do their own thing, and they don't have to feel like they have to live up to anything, which I think takes a lot of pressure off both of those guys. I'll see. So the Cowboys, honestly, Ryan, technically have six on the All Mountain West first team with Cam Stone <laughs> at Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> who who got snubbed? In your opinion, Cole from the Goodbow. Kid. Huge. Cole Goodbow. He gets hurt for, what, five, six games last year, and they forget yeah. that he's one of the best defensive tackles yeah. west of the Mississippi? I think he'd be in an NFL training camp if he was healthy for all 13 games last yeah, year. Yeah, I think he'd be gone. Yeah. I mean, so this could be a blessing in disguise that he got hurt because I really think he was probably done yeah. if, he, if he'd had the monster season he was supposed to. I would say Fia. Um, it's hard for media to vote on offensive linemen. I mean, none of us – break down the film but uh, from everything everybody I've talked to and I'm just watching uh, Fia is potentially an all Mountain West first team center he's 323 pounds and he's lost like 30 pounds he said mm -hmm. uh, and I, I loved hearing that Frank Crum said it Craig Bowl said it he has a new dedication this offseason and it's not to be in the McDonald's drive through <laughs> and he's really showing up and he looks good man it, it kind of reminds me of Erica Boje a couple years ago when he said man I couldn't even breathe in the huddle I couldn't even talk and then he showed up 50 pounds lighter and, and turned into a really good player yeah I think we we take all the preseason polls and and lists with a with a grain of salt yeah, obviously absolutely. and uh, I think it was it was funny talking to Easton because he said I don't really look too much into this stuff but then Cole Goodbow is going to kind of use that not getting picked as some motivation. So I, yeah. th I thought that was kind of funny. I thought Trayton Welch was kind of hosed myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's Another a really one of those good old guys. Yeah. yeah. He's a really good player. And, uh, you know, who else did we hear about all year? John Michael Gillenborg. Uh, that's a guy who played in three high school football games in his life. Uh, yeah. Wasn't even a football, he's a basketball player yeah. and a baseball guy. Um, so Craig knows how to find him, man. You cannot argue you can I think what Wyoming fans are so pissed about and I get it is it feels waste so many wasted seasons with so much talent it's never everybody always said right Ryan our whole life it's so hard to recruit to Wyoming <laughs> Craig Bull's making it look real easy Craig even mentioned the the 2016 Mountain West Championship game between Wyoming and Boise State there was San Diego State yeah or San Diego there were yeah double-digit NFL players on the field that night, and, and most of them were on Wyoming's team. So, yeah. you know, he's kind of his own worst enemy. He finds these diamonds in the rough, uh, develops them into not just NFL players, NFL star players. Yeah. Uh, Josh Allen is top five star in the NFL. Logan Wilson is a top five linebacker in the NFL. Uh, Dewey Wingard is beloved in Jacksonville. Epps, Epps just signed a huge cashing, contract. Big. Uh, and I see Gibbs more along the, the Dewey Wingard, like unheralded, probably maybe even undrafted, but he's going to be in the NFL for five years and then, uh, you know, have a good life. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I mean, obviously he talks about the walk-on culture here at Wyoming, but that was how many of these guys that are projected to start started as walk-ons yeah Craig had a, a really good quote just about starting these guys off giving them an opportunity obviously you take some classes and learn from the guys ahead of you and you look at a guy like Goodbo or uh, Bertinoli and it's he's all Mountain West and he started as a walk-on from Casper so I mean that's a receiver yeah starts starts <laughs> at the bottom I think I think it's a good example here what he's got going. That's the, the guy I'm really curious about from an NFL perspective, and I'll obviously, you know, to get these guys over the hump is Frank Crum, a dominant right tackle, a mountain of a man. Now he's going to be left tackle. You know, I think he'll do fine, and, and that's great news for Peasley. Maybe Peasley goes through unscathed because uh, the mountain is protecting him, but if Crom can show athleticism at left tackle with that size, yeah, uh, he can make a lot of money. Looking at an NFL guy there too. Yeah, he is a mountain of a man. I don't even know how Peasley's going to see over him. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's incredible. Uh, something that was really cool this weekend, guys, is Easton Gibbs talking to him about something you, we've talked about it, but something that's so lost these days and this day and age with his loyalty and stuff. It was great. He was like, 
nobody gave me a chance. Nobody came to my high school. He was asked about the recruiting process, and he's like, uh, Wyoming, that, that's it. And, yeah. oh, nobody else was coming to your school? He's like, we didn't have a, we were awful. We didn't have a good team. We didn't have a good program. No college coaches talked to any of us. Wyoming did, and Wyoming stuck with me, and and I, I'm loyal, and they've accepted me as a state. As a state, um, they've accepted me into their family. And he's going to rodeos in Sheridan, and going to Frontier Days, and this is a kid from San Diego that is living it up and totally engulfed in Wyoming culture. Yeah, I think in, in this day and age, it's it's refreshing to, to yeah. hear a guy talk like that. I mean, he literally said two or three times, "Wyoming is my home, Laramie is my home," and he. He said he, he never even considered looking at the portal. I mean, obviously, he said he, he heard some, some whispers. That'd but, be hard, too. I mean, you're talking Power 5 teams in the Pac-12, the teams he grew up uh, watching. It's hard to say no to this stuff. Yeah, yeah it's got to be encouraging to Wyoming fans. I know, you know, you, you get bummed out when, you know, uh, a pregnant goes to USC or especially the year before when guys you were used to seeing all went to Power 5 seemingly – Solomon Bird and, and on and on the list went. But clearly they have a profile they're looking for and that profile has worked with a lot of guys and that's, you know, guys with a chip on their shoulder, in a lot of cases walk-ons or no-star recruits. And the fact that so many guys are paying that loyalty back has to be encouraging because it's not, you know, these guys had a chance to leave, they're not leaving. And now with uh, you know, a collective forming in the state of Wyoming, these are the type of guys that can be rewarded with that. Uh, the Maldonados of the football world yeah. can be rewarded with their loyalty. And, you know, Hunter Maldonado did well uh, in terms of NIL. So yeah. uh, it's not the end of the world for Wyoming. They, they're just adapting to it. Well, once again, Wyoming Cowboys picked to finish sixth. Don't love it. They don't care. Uh, I think they love it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think they love it. And I think they genuinely don't give a damn. It means absolutely nothing. Uh, The Cowboys were picked to finish, what, second to last last year with New Mexico, which was perfect. It was a perfect spot for them anyway because they had had no idea. Uh, Once again, too, five uh, five players make the All-Mountain West first team. John Hoyland, who could have easily been the uh, special teams player of the year as well. I think Browning got it over him probably because he's a dual punter and kicker. Uh, Devon Harris, uh, Frank Crum, uh, Jordan Bertinelli, and Devon Harris uh, definitely missed the boat, in our opinion, on Cole Goodbow and probably Trayton Welch, maybe even uh, uh, Tulifono. Um, really good player. So um, we got to get out of here. We got to catch a plane unless you guys are still canceled or oh, delayed. It's, it's delayed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We heard you're getting some weather in Wyoming right now. We're getting some weather here, too, about 117 <laughs> degrees, uh, hotter than hell. But. It's exciting, though, isn't it, guys? This is the the start, the unofficial start or the official start of a new season. Cowboys open camp on August 2nd in Laramie. Uh, Texas Tech's 44 days away. And Alex needs to get a vacation in at some point. Oh, but, uh, we'll see about that. If there was, uh, <laughs> if there was ever a year for, for Wyoming to win the Mountain West, I I get the sense that it would. the time is now. So yeah. That, it's exciting. And what do Wyoming fans always – you know, on these surveys, and like, what do they want to see? Big name opponents yep. in in the in War Memorial Stadium. Well, Texas Tech beat Texas last year. They beat Oklahoma last year. They beat Ole Miss last year. Yep. Uh, and they are loaded. So, uh, you know, I, I would expect a sellout for that game. And if Wyoming were to win it, you know, all of a sudden the expectations that are low right now go through the roof. And the expectations honestly shouldn't be low right now. I'm not trying to get people all fired up to, you know, have them jump off a cliff. That's not it. I I really feel – I've had a feeling about this team for a long time. Defense wins championships, right? Yeah. Allegedly. Yeah. I I just mean in terms of, like, all of a sudden this game is on CBS. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden, you know, The Athletic or – you know, Sports Illustrated are going to be like, oh, who are the group of five teams that can play the New Year's? Well, if you beat Texas Tech Mm -hmm. and compete at Texas and then win win the Mountain West, uh, you're probably going to a New Year's (laughs) Six Bowl game. So I don't want to, you know, raise expectations to an unrealistic level, but the schedule is in place to where if you go 10-2, and you are – Making some national news. Yep. They're lying in the weeds. (laughs) So it's been said a lot. 
Uh, guys, thanks for joining me. It's been great hanging out this weekend. Excited to be back on the road with you guys, too. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun this year all the way around. Dealing with you obnoxious fans 24-7. <laughs> but uh, keep the questions coming. We'll keep the stories coming. Thanks, fellas. Yeah, for yep, sure. Appreciate it. it.